Okay, so you're looking for a new job as a Java backend developer, or you're just trying to improve your skills and cover the gaps in your knowledge. How do you go about planning your learning path to be a good backend server-side Java developer? Where do you start? What topics do you cover? And in what order? This video will give you the answers you need. Here's the thing about backend development or server-side development in Java today. There's a whole lot of technologies and buzzwords involved. So for someone who's new to the field or for someone who has not been in touch with the developments over the years, it can be quite tricky to navigate through what's going on or even where to start. How do you become a good Java backend developer and where do you start learning? Let me remove all the buzzwords and jargon out of the picture and start from the basics. In this video, I'm going to lay down a basic learning path that you can take and plan for. I'm obviously not gonna be 100% accurate and 100% comprehensive and cover everything. That's not possible in a video of this nature. What I wanna do in this video is cover some of the popular and more important options for a newcomer to get started with. And if you're someone who's already a Java developer, you can see what are the gaps in your knowledge and what you don't know and what you need to focus on. Starting from the beginning, the very first thing you need to focus on and get good at is the Java programming language. This is a no brainer, but it's surprising to me how oblivious some people are to this concept. Uh, I often meet people who think that they have to learn this fancy new framework or that shiny new technology. The, hang on a minute. Before you learn all that, how much of the language do you actually know? How good are you in coding in Java? For better or for worse, Java is now in a very rapid cadence with new features and releases. So if you haven't been keeping yourself updated with the new stuff in Java, there's a lot of catching up to do actually. So I recommend you start here first. Once you learn how to code well in Java, you can be good at coding in any related framework or technology you might choose later. So what do you learn in the language? After you covered like the basics about how to write loops and if blocks, focus on the main language paradigms and make sure you get them, right? Something like polymorphism and object-oriented programming in general, stuff like generics, concurrency, collection APIs, you know, that kind of stuff. You can pick up any online Java course and look at the table of contents to see what you don't know very well and what you should be learning and then you can plan your learning path based on that. After you're comfortable with Java, Next, you should focus on testing, specifically JUnit. JUnit is one of those things that you kind of have to deal with as a Java programmer, but it's not something you study up when you're preparing for a job interview because people rarely get asked anything about JUnit during interviews, even though it's like a fact of life for a majority of Java programmers. So if you're preparing for an interview, then you might want to skip this one and get a job and then get back to this and learn JUnit because writing and maintaining test cases is essential, right? Asserting test conditions, mocking objects using something called Mockito. These are all essential skills. Okay, from here, there are three directions you can go. Although this is kind of a false choice and you're very, very, very likely gonna be choosing among two of the options that I mentioned here, or maybe even just one of these three. On the one hand, you can choose to specialize in desktop programming, right? Building applications that run on desktop machines using JavaFX, are slightly older swing technologies. Notice that it says swing here, not spring, all right? Spring is a completely different thing. We'll get back to that in a bit. So will you go down this route? Very likely, no. There are not a lot of people programming desktop apps these days. There is a need for desktop apps in Java, don't get me wrong. It is just that the number of apps and the number of developers are in the minority compared to the other two options here. The second, and slightly more popular option is developing apps for the Android platform. You can build apps for Android devices using Java. There are other options for languages, of course, including Kotlin, but this is another path you can take once you're comfortable with Java. You can specialize and become an application developer. What to learn here? Again, look at any of the hundreds of courses that are available online uh, for Android programming and browse through the table of contents. This should give you a good idea of the topics that you need to dive into. The third and the most popular option for Java developers is server-side programming. 
This is kind of what I want to focus on in this video. There are a huge number of technologies and learning paths you can take for this option itself. I will cover two major branches with honorable mentions of some others. So if your favorite technology does not get a mention here, please don't hate on me. I'm just trying to provide a simple introduction that covers the more popular options, all right? I'm not trying to be comprehensive here. So what is server-side programming in Java? It's also referred to as back-end programming. This basically refers to writing applications that are deployed and they run on the server. As you can tell, this is a very broad definition. It primarily covers two major types of applications. One is web applications, where users open a browser, load a URL, they get sent an HTML page. This HTML page is generated on the spot at runtime by Java code that's running on the server. So every user gets a different HTML page with different data and contents. You must be familiar with this concept. The second use case for server-side applications are APIs. These are uh, application endpoints that are not meant to be used directly by end users, but they're for other applications to call. The applications that call these uh, server-side APIs could be running on desktops, they could be running on a phone, or even on a server as a web application. So either way, you're building web applications or APIs, we are looking at server-side programming. Let's say you decide to go with server-side programming. Well, congratulations on your choice, because like I said, this is a very popular choice with a lot of demand. Mm, not that Android or desktop applications is a bad choice, okay? That's good too. Oh man, okay, moving on. What should I learn for server-side programming? Let's say I'm getting started, right? What do I learn? I highly recommend you start with servlets and JSPs. Servlets are the way you get into Java on the server side, right? This is the way to get Java to run on the server side. They are like the fundamental foundational technologies on top of which all other Java web technologies are built, right? Would you be coding servlets directly as an enterprise Java developer? Well, probably not but understanding how servlets work is important to understanding how Java works on the server. And in the process of understanding servlets, you'll also be understanding how HTTP works, what a servlet container is, and you'll really get the whole picture of having code run on the server to handle web requests. So I highly recommend it. From here, you'll be moving to the more enterprisey side of Java development. There are technologies and frameworks used by big enterprise companies to manage web applications of large size and complexity. You have two very popular alternatives here. One option is to learn and become good at a framework called the Spring Framework. It's a very popular choice, and honestly, you can build pretty much any kind of Java application you can think of using the Spring Framework. It is very robust as well as configurable and customizable. If you go down this path, you will first need to learn the inner workings of the Spring framework, right? It's the framework itself. Then you'll move on to Spring MVC, which is what you use to build web applications and APIs with Spring. Then you can learn about database connectivity, especially with relational databases that are very common to enterprise systems. There is this concept called object relational mapping or ORM. The idea is that when you work with objects in the Java application world, there are usually problems that uh, deal with connecting to the database that follows a relational model. So you're dealing with two different models. So it's handy to have this thing called object relational mapping or ORM that lets you map these two concepts and allow you to work with Java objects in the Java world while still maintaining meaningful interactions with the relational database world. A popular framework that does ORM and is very commonly used with Spring is a framework called Hibernate. Okay, so once you learn about all these various options that are available to you in Spring, and you realize the amount of pain involved in creating and configuring a new Spring project, well, you experience the pain, you utter some profanities, and then you learn about Spring Boot. Spring Boot is a really cool way of creating new Spring projects. You will learn about Spring Boot, you can see how it takes away most of the pain, most of the trouble with Spring projects. From here on, you can take a look at various other projects in the Spring framework family. You see, Spring is not just the core framework itself. There are other projects that provide additional functionalities that plug into a Spring application and they kind of work well with it. For example, there is advanced tooling to work with relational or NoSQL databases using Spring data. 
are tooling for building microservices with Spring, again, using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud projects. So check out the Spring website at spring.io to learn more about what are the options that are available to you. Okay, so this was about Spring. An alternative to the Spring route for building enterprise software is the Java EE route, Java Enterprise Edition route. So Java EE, it's also called Jakarta EE, is a set of standard specifications that outline how enterprise software is built and what are the APIs that are available to it. So unlike the Spring world, where you kind of pick and choose the options for various things like the MVC layer, the data connectivity layer, and so on, in the Java EE world, everything is pretty much standardized. It's all assembled and put together for you to use uh, using a web application server that's called the Java EE application server. You write your code, assuming that everything you need in the specification is available, right? So as long as it's a part of the standards, it'll be available to you. So there are some advantages. There are both advantages and disadvantages to using this approach, obviously. I won't get into the details here. However, the advantages here, as far as chalking out your learning path is concerned, is this. Since this is a standard, there's not a lot of choosing and evaluating options that you need to do. So just look at the Java E spec and the associated technologies and learn whatever technologies that are out there in that spec that you need to do what you want to do. Right? So for example, if you want to build a REST API in Java EE, where you learn JAX RS. If you want to learn to connect to a relational database, use JPA. So these are technologies that are designed for specific purposes and they're a part of the specification. So finding what you need to learn and what you need to use is very, very straightforward. In fact, the servlets and JSPs that you would have learned in the previous step, they're a part of this Java EE spec. So you kind of already have a start to Java EE at this point in your learning path. There are, of course, other Java frameworks for building enterprise applications that I haven't covered here. For example, you have the Play framework or Drop Wizard. These are really, really good, but there are nowhere near the kind of popularity that these two options have. So I'll leave them out of this video for the sake of simplicity. With the major frameworks out of the way, now I'd like to talk about what I call auxiliary knowledge or technologies that I think are usually handy when working with Java, especially enterprise Java. First, is a good understanding of design patterns. Design patterns are kind of like tried and tested recipes for handling complex problems. So learning and having these patterns as tools in your tool belt is vital once you start working in any programming language, let alone Java. Second, spend some time getting familiar with the Git source control system. More and more companies are adopting Git for their source control. And also GitHub is a very popular home for a lot of open source projects today. So learn how to work with Git, understand what branches are, what commits and pull requests are. This is a, this is a really important thing to know. Next, spend some time understanding the build systems and the build process. Learn a build tool like Maven or Gradle. Understand CICD, which stands for Continuous Integration and Continuous Delivery. Most organizations use Continuous Delivery model for developing and deploying code. The idea is that people check in their code to their source control system, and then there is this process which is constantly watching it, and it automatically gets new code, builds it, runs tests, and gets everything ready to deploy to production, usually with like a click of a button, right? This is super cool. Next, there is a significant trend towards microservices as of me recording this video. So learn what microservices are and how you can create microservices with Java. Understand kind of like the principles of how you can architect a good microservice and what are the properties or characteristics that a good microservice should have. Finally, I recommend you to spend some time learning about standard computer data structures and algorithms. This is kind of a controversial topic because a lot of people feel that this is a skill that's kind of a necessary evil, right? It's useful only in the context of interviews. I've talked to people who kind of hate the fact that they have to learn algorithms and data structures after years of computer programming experience in the industry where they've never had to write a single sorting algorithm of their own. This is, this is a valid argument and I kind of understand why people are reluctant to learn about these algorithms just for the sake of cracking interviews. But I kind of see it a bit differently. You see, I think of everything we write in our code as software developers as some manifestation of some algorithm. We may not be writing sorting or searching algorithms, but we do write some algorithms, no matter what you're coding, right? The objective of that algorithm is uh, to solve the problem that you're working on, right? So as with any skill, it helps to study the classics, right? So just like a good author reads classic literature or like a good musician 
or listens to great compositions, a good computer programmer should have a good knowledge and appreciation of classical algorithms. It'll affect the way you think in code in general. I, I can tell you that. It usually affects it for the better. So I recommend you do this. Finally, one last piece I want to leave you with at the end of this video. A big part of mastering any aspect of any of these topics that I've covered so far is to actually build stuff with them. I cannot emphasize this enough. Don't just read a book or watch a video, build something. Take an example project, build it, try out these concepts. I'll tell you, it'll not be very easy in the beginning, but once you start writing code, it gets easier and easier to gain mastery over these topics and you'll get better over time. So definitely work on these, write code and learn in the process. All right, so there you have it. This is the complete basic getting started learning path map for getting into the Java programming world or preparing for an interview or getting better at the job you already have. I've published this learning path map as a PDF file that you can download in the link in the description. Take a look at it, see what are the things you already know, see what are the things you need to focus on and prepare your learning path. And also let me know in the comments if you have any other suggestions for things you would like to add to this learning path or your favorite framework that I missed from this list. Uh, there are some links in this video to details about some of the topics and uh, names that I've introduced in this video. Click on them to get like a 10 minute introduction to each of these concepts. Even if you're already familiar with these concepts, I can guarantee you that in just these 10 minutes, you will definitely learn something new about these topics that you didn't already know. So check them out and thanks for watching.